We're pleased to welcome Dr. Eugene Rogers from UNC at Greensboro. Uh, Dr. Rogers taught from 1993 to 2005 at the University of Virginia, where for several years he chaired the program in theology, ethics, and culture. In 2005, he joined his husband at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where he is professor of religious studies and faculty in women's and gender studies. In 2002-03, Dr. Rogers was the Eli Lilly, Lilly <laughs> visiting associate professor of Christian thought and practice in the religion department at Princeton University. He held fellowships from the Fulbright Commission, the Mellon Foundation, the National Humanities Center, the Lilly Foundation, the Center of Theological Inquiry at Princeton Seminary, the Center for the Study of Religion at Princeton University, Tantur Ecumenical Re Institute in Jerusalem, and the Templeton Foundation. He is author or editor of six books and over 40 articles and translations. His book, Sexuality and the Christian Body, was named Essential Reading among books published in the past 25 years by Christian Century in 2010. His most recent book is Aquinas and the Supreme Court, Race, Gender, and the Failure of Natural Law in Thomas's Biblical Commentaries. His seventh book, now in progress, is called The Persistence of Blood, How Blood Talk Seeps In Where It Hardly Seems to Belong. So we're delighted to welcome Dr. Rogers back to Princeton and are looking forward to engaging with his lecture this evening. The lecture is entitled Bridegroom of Blood, Desire and the Blood of Christ. Please welcome Dr. Eugene Rogers. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Um, thanks to Princeton Seminary and to Andrew and Nicola and to the Center of Theological Inquiry where some of these thoughts began to be worked out um, several years ago. And uh, uh, thanks also to Princeton University for co-sponsoring. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, and uh, thank you all for showing up on a Friday night. Part one. From 2007 to 9, I sat, thanks in part to Ellen Cherry, who told liberals and conservatives to, one, to treat one another as belonging to different religions because that way we would treat each other better. I sat on an expert panel convened by the House of Bishops of the U.S. Episcopal Church to advise them on quote, a theology of same-sex relationships. Of everything the panelists said, PhDs all teaching at respected institutions, the most arresting to an anthropologist of religion might be, quote, the trouble with same-sex relationships is they impugn the blood of Christ. They do what? impugn the blood of Christ. After I got over being offended, I found myself fascinated. What could that possibly mean? What would an anthropologist say? The original remark attempted a hazing. The final result bestowed a gift, the gift of blood made strange. Can you hear me in the back? Sometimes the mic is catching my voice and sometimes not quite. Everybody can hear, yes? The familiar domesticated language of the blood of Christ became again, as it was in the beginning, the occasion of offense. What tribe is this with their strange ways and their even stranger bloody-mindedness. This paper turns on two sentences. The first you have just heard, same-sex couples, quote, impugn the blood of Christ, unquote. First, I use religious studies categories to understand that sentence, which I call the antithesis. I conclude that blood of Christ language, like same-sex couples, is not going away, but can only be reclaimed. Then I use theological categories to elaborate a second sentence, which I call the thesis. The thief on the cross 
is the bride of Christ. Thus, two opposing sentences, same-sex couples impugn Christ's blood, and the thief on the cross is his bride. Repurposing a phrase from Exodus, I observe with others that Christ is a bridegroom of blood. Two, consider blood in these quotations from the Bible. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7.14. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, Hebrews 9.22. The city sheds blood from her midst, that her time may come and makes idols to defile herself. Ezekiel 22, 3. Sometimes blood cleanses so that a red substance makes clothes white, much as non-chlorine bleach is blue. This blood, like soap from ash, is made by sacrifice. Other blood defiles. The city bleeds from her middle to defile herself. This blood is also gendered. When men, Jesus, Abraham, shed blood in sacrifice, it cleanses. When women shed blood in menstruation and childbirth, it's so powerful that men regard it as dangerous. Women, as a rule, may not sacrifice, that is, in many traditions, no women priests. Men, as a rule, may not show female characteristics. Blood acquires two different roles because society uses it to reinforce two genders regarded as binary. Gendered blood is no ancient prejudice only, but marks Christianity today. Nancy J. observes that Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, who regard the Eucharist as chiefly reenacting Christ's sacrifice, call their leaders priests, that is, sacrificers, and restrict that role to men, while Protestants, who regard the Eucharist as chiefly reenacting Christ's Supper, call their leaders ministers, serving a meal, and more easily open that role to women. Anglicans, in between, are typically split. Ex-gay ministries also use blood of Christ language to police gender roles. Blood is supposed to wash gay people with the atonement, even as self-accepting gay people say they don't need cleansing. The blood of Christ is supposed to unite Christians in the cup of the Eucharist, even as debates over sexuality divide the churches. The blood of Christ is supposed to protect the apostolic succession, even as bishops protect priests for sexual crimes. To conservative Christians, these failures of the blood of Christ bring nothing less than a cosmological disturbance. Three. Durkheim, Mary Douglas, Nancy Jay, and Bettina Biltower in Medieval Blood, which is better than Bynum, illuminate blood structures in Christianity and other social groups that cause the body individual or the body sacrificed to represent the body social. Blood may be red 
because iron compounds make it so. But societies draft its color and stickiness for purposes of their own. We imagine individual, social, and animal bodies as securely bounded. Inside, blood carries life. Outside, blood marks the body fertile or at risk. According to Bildhauer, societies work to maintain Society's work to maintain bodily integrity thus takes place in blood. It's the body's permeability that leaves us bloody-minded. It's in terms of blood that society makes a body. The body becomes a membrane to pass when it breathes, eats, perspires, eliminates, ejaculates, conceives, or bleeds. Only bleeding evokes so swift and public a response. Blood brings mother to child, bystander to victim, ambulance to patient, soldier to comrade, midwife to mother, defender to border. When society is a body, Society's integrity is blood's work. Since Durkheim, students of religion have called the totem the elementary form of religious life. Since Maximus Confessor, and reaching a high point in Thomas Aquinas, theologians have insisted on working by analogy. In Christian theology, analogy is no literary comparison, but names competing accounts of the largest repeating structures that hold the symbol system together. But theologians and anthropologists need not quarrel over terms. Analogy is just the theological word for totemism or totemism is just the secular word with which sociology acknowledges analogy. Aquinas and Durkheim would agree that Christianity paints a pattern according to which the body of Jesus is the body of Christ, the church is the body of Christ, the bread of the Eucharist is the body of Christ, the believer belongs to the body of Christ. The crucifix around her neck displays the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the body of God. No Christianity exists without some version of this pattern, which theology calls analogy and Durkheim totemism. Closely allied with the body of Christ is his blood, which the New Testament cites three times as often as his cross and five times as often as his death. The blood from the cross is the blood of Christ. The wine of the Eucharist is the blood of Christ. The means of atonement is the blood of Christ. The unity of the church is the blood of Christ, the kinship of believers is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation is the blood of Christ, icons is the blood of Christ, and the blood of Christ is the blood of God. The blood of Christ works by analogy in Christian theology and as totem in Christian practice. It names a large-scale structure that holds together cosmology, fictive kinship, gender roles, ritual practices, atonement for sin, solidarity in suffering, and recruits history, geography, and martyrs to its purpose. Unlike cleansing, defiling, and inside, outside, the analogical or totemic pattern escapes the binary 
although it can uphold or undermine binaries at need. When conflict reveals the body as penetrable, we glimpse that the body does not define itself, but society uses its bleeding to redline its borders. Lately, issues as diverse as atonement, evolution, women's leadership, and same-sex marriage disturb and revive the symbol system that the blood of Christ <coughs> structures, <coughs> cleanses, and unites. In theology and anthropology, blood outside the body is matter out of place. Abel's blood cries out from the ground. But menstruation and childbirth present an alternative picture where outside blood promises new life. Exegetes argue whether the blood of Christ means life or death, but blood provides the language in which they disagree. Given that status, blood becomes natural for Christians to think with. How could it be otherwise? Something that resisted analysis in terms of Christ's blood would be either irrelevant to the whole complex of relations among the community, its God and its world, or something too foreign for the body of Christ to digest, something the blood of Christ could not cure or clean. Such an exception could only threaten the whole system, could only call up what Durkheim called moral effervescence and what its defenders call outrage. Sex and gender issues now seem to some Christians to threaten, to others to restore, the whole analogical system by which Christianity rests on the incarnation of Christ and lives by his blood. Same-sex marriage is now perhaps the most controverted of those claims. Sociologists of religion like Durkheim and Mary Douglas help show why conservatives invoke the language of blood and liberals seek first to avoid and then at length to reclaim it. Avoidance only forces blood talk underground to exercise its baleful influence out of conscious sight. Mary Douglas tells us why, and Jesus shows us what to do about it. Four. In a book I stole from Chuck Matthews in 2005 and have yet to return, Douglas wrote about Durkheim. Quote, Durkheim thought the reaction of outrage when entrenched judgments are challenged is a gut response directly due to commitment to a social group. Directly? Isn't that a bit strong? Durkheim and Douglas think not. When a dissident challenges entrenched judgments without communally recognized reasons, the visceral reaction is, that's not playing by the rules. You can't neglect community norms without making the hearer's blood pump faster and her blood pressure go up. The group calls the dissident to account. Give our reasons. If the challenger does give reasons, and they seem instead to undermine the community and its communal practices of thinking, the challenge rises to an entirely different level. If I, the listener, should join the challenger in adopting reasons that lead out of the community's thinking, then the challenger is leading me 
the challenger is leading me outside the community. I cannot adopt the new view without isolating myself from my allies and support. I become a heretic or a traitor. That's why Ellen Cherry told us to treat each other as if we belonged to different religions. We wouldn't feel so betrayed. I change sides, where sides are the two sides of the community boundary. From in, I go out. The social body bleeds. The challenger, therefore, is not persuading me so much to change my mind as tempting me to change my loyalty, to betray and isolate myself. The boundary crossing reason threatens me with self-betrayal, abandonment, perhaps worse. If the threat seems future, I feel fear. If the threat seems present, I feel anger. I dare not let challenging reasons put me outside the gate. Social solidarity explains even appeals to nature and nature's law. Douglas explains that, quote, individuals, as they pick and choose among the analogies from nature, those they will give credence to, are also picking and choosing their allies and opponents and the pattern of their future relations. The dissident reason does not so much break the rules of the cosmology as it breaks the bonds of the society. The society that coheres because it has constructed that cosmology together. A convention acquires social reality, Douglas says, when, quote, the final answer refers to the way in which the planets are fixed in the sky or the way that humans or animals naturally behave. That's why the blood of Christ comes up. It's cosmological. Douglas continues, according to Durkheim's theory, the elementary social bond is only formed when individuals entrench in their minds a model of the social order. They furnish their minds, Douglas says, as society writ small. Such minds know that to cross the frontiers of thought is to leave the group. That's why an attack on cosmology attacks the group and rouses emotions to its defense. The group maintains a shared picture of the world to sustain its solidarity. The group that classifies together stays together. This bond made visible and defensible is what Durkheim calls the sacred, where commitment becomes explicit and solidarity gets practice. Just now, in multiple denominations and around the world, the bond and boundary runs right through same-sex relationships and trans people. Years ago, an undergrad in my course, God, the Body, and Sexual Orientation, said she'd spent hours arguing with a hallmate about same-sex relationships. She was winning the argument, she said, when her hallmate just walked away. Why did she, the hallmate, walk away? The student asked. Because, I said, you weren't really asking her to change her mind. You were asking her to leave her community. If she changes her mind about this, she crosses a line. She's out. 
That's how not only same-sex relationships, but even views about them, attract the power nowadays to impugn the blood of Christ. It happens four ways. One, the blood of Christ in the atonement is supposed to cure sin. Homosexuality, traditionally, counted as sin. But gay people, I should say lesbian and gay people, and the pastoral experience of conservative counselors themselves both suggest that the atonement does not, in fact, cure homosexuality. So same-sex relationships impugn or fight against this blood of Christ with alarming effectiveness. In this version of the atonement, same-sex relationships defeat the blood of Christ. That makes a cosmological disturbance. Second explanation. The blood of Christ in communion is supposed to keep the community together. A member of our panel came from a diocese which had recently split. He said he couldn't go to communion with us, and he teared up. The blood of Christ in communion wasn't working either. I should read that with different emphasis. The blood of Christ in communion wasn't working either. Three, the blood of Christ marks not only the external bounds of a community where it bleeds, blood marks also the internal lines, the veins. And the most prominent internal line in all the heteronormative denominations from Catholic to Baptist, runs between male and female. Often because male and female marks the internal line between clergy gendered male and laity gendered female. Therefore, also the fourth reason, inversions of Christianity that see the Eucharist as more a sacrifice than a meal same-sex relationships undermine the homosocial fathering of the hierarchy, that is, ordination. The way in which sacrifice defines a community of fathers and sons by doing birth better. This is Nancy J. If you're graduate students and you haven't read Nancy J throughout your generations forever. Go and read it. Um, according to Nancy J., the Roman pater familias recognized his biological and adopted sons at family sacrifices. If they were present at the sacrifice, they counted as sons. The Roman church continues the episcopal fathering of priests at a sacrifice, the sacrifice of the mass. This makes same-sex relationships especially fraught. So to answer my initial question, how do same-sex relationships impugn the blood of Christ? The answer is fourfold. They disrupt the curing of the atonement and cause a cosmological disturbance. They disrupt the unifying of communion and, and permit schism. They disrupt traditional gender roles and bring social change. And they disrupt the fathering of the hierarchy that itself takes place in sacrifice and bring us full circle back to the sacrifice of the atonement. Having understood Christian blood discourse as an anthropologist, my task now as a theologian is to repair it. 
if anthropology explains that same-sex couples can count as a cosmological disturbance, theology replies that the real cosmological disturbance, as Sarah Coakley points out, is the incarnation. It is Jesus the Logos, after all, who is the boundary-crossing reason. It's hardly surprising, therefore, if Christology should queer gender roles. Part five. Conservatives make sexuality a mark of human lack of control, and thus homosexuality a special sign of the fall. That was not always the case but a response to the claim not to need curing by the blood of Christ, a claim that becomes more threatening the more its critics suspect that it's true. Goodness then seems to depend upon mortifying a sinful body on the pattern of bloody atonement. Women and sexual minorities are invited to take up their cross and follow Jesus. Ask whether the one making the demand is willing to join you on the cross as Jesus joined the thief. Ask who holds the hammer and the nails. I propose to keep blood and desire together in a marital theory of the atonement, safe for same-sex couples. The thief on the cross is the bride of Christ. I elaborate its elements in order. The thief. The thesis opposes theft with gift. The original sin took place by force or too soon. I'm sorry, the original sin took by force or too soon what God would give as gift. In that, it resembles rape. But God always intended the human being for fellowship with God. And when the snake said, you shall be like God, that was true. Only divinity was not to be gained by grasping. In the Philippians hymn, Jesus precisely reverses the fall by counting equality with God not a thing to be grasped. If the original sin was reaching up to seize divinity, then the fall did not occur as so often because the body, being lower, let us down. But because the mind, overreaching, tipped us over. Adam did not stoop and fall down, but reached too high and fell over. After the fall, the body told the truth and gave the mind the lie. You are no God, but creature still. The fall's result was not that the body corrupted the mind. The fall's result was that the mind scorned the body for proving it wrong. In counting equality not a thing to be grasped, Jesus reverses the grasping. It is precisely the thief, the grasper, to whom Jesus has come. The thief on the cross. Why does Jesus not climb down from the cross? Why does he stay up? 
On the vulgar version of the Anselmian theory, he stays up to pay a debt for sin. On my version, which accords well with other bits of Anselm, as I'll show, Jesus stays on the cross out of solidarity with the thief. In becoming incarnate, Jesus reverses the scorn of the body by re-befriending it, and just so keeps faith with the thief. This day you will be with me in paradise. Jesus cannot consummate the thief's desire by abandoning him. He can only consummate the thief's desire, which is his own, by staying with him. This is the pattern. Jesus will give by grace what Adam tried to take by force. The atonement replaces a rape with a wedding. The thief on the cross is the bride. Christian heirs of the medieval traditions, West and East, not only may, but must say this. All Christians of whatever gender are brides of Christ. That insight frees Anselm to use erotic imagery in his Meditation on Human Redemption. At communion, Anselm addresses himself, quote, Taste the goodness of your Redeemer. Be on fire with love for your Savior. Chew the honeycomb of his words. Suck their flavor, which is sweeter than sap. Swallow their wholesome sweetness. Chew by thinking. Suck by understanding. Swallow by loving and rejoicing. He's not finished yet. Be glad to chew. Be thankful to suck. Rejoice to swallow. See, Christian soul, here is the cause of your redemption. Chew this. Bite it. Suck it. Let your heart swallow it when your mouth receives the body and blood of your Redeemer. Make it in this life your daily bread, for through this and not otherwise than through this will you remain in Christ and Christ in you. Parenthesis, to accept Christ for Anselm means to accept him into your mouth. Cleave to him, my soul, and never leave off. Good Lord, do not reject me. I faint with hunger for your love. Refresh me with it. Take me and possess me wholly, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit are alone blessed to ages of ages. Here endeth the reading from Anselm. Anselm can use such language, by the way, not only when convention genders his soul feminine, but even in male-male relations, calling his teacher amplectissime, a vocative superlative, campier than a show tune, embraceablest you. Anselm's atonement takes place by a marital exchange of bodily fluids. Debt payment belongs in this context. Debt payment belongs in a married household. The bridegroom did not bleed, but for the love of the bride, so that even in Anselm, God meets God's demand with God's body and pays a debt with a bodily donation. 
Where else but in marriage do adults freely pay one another's debts? And some calls himself by baptism, quote, betrothed to Christ, and therefore, quote, a dowager with the Holy Spirit. In the technical meaning of a widow receiving for life a share of her husband's estate. You've seen this on TV. You'd think Anselm's Abbey was Downton. <laughs> no one has put it more familiarly than Samuel Wesley. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. And no one has put it more vividly than Jacob of Sarug. The king's son made a marriage feast in blood at Golgotha. There the daughter of the day was betrothed to him to be his and the royal ring was beaten out in the nails of his hands. With his holy blood was this betrothal made. He led her into the garden, the bridal chamber he had prepared for her. At what wedding feast apart from this did they break the body of the groom for food? in place of other, uh, I'm sorry, for guests in place of other food. Now, usually in traditional literatures, the woman suffers for the man. Jesus, the bridegroom, subverts that pattern. Here, the one gendered male suffers for the one gendered female. Uh, I'm skipping to a shorter improved passage. What is lost in the absence of blood is the church's ability to rehear and reclaim the blood language redirected by Jesus. The church has heard for half a century that Christian blood talk is dangerous. Yes, it is dangerous. But the protest has been naive about our social anthropology. I intervene in the critique not to disagree, but to observe that Christian blood language is not going away. And the options are not exhausted by leaving it unchanged on the one hand or denying it on the other. A third option remains, to repeat blood's language subversively, to free it from contexts of oppression or violence. I'm channeling Judith Butler. This way we reclaim or as Butler says, mobilize the signifier for an alternative production. Christianity's paradigm for that procedure is Jesus' remark, this is my body given for you. Catholic Eucharistic theology, I mean Bernard Cook and John Paul II, make it a marital remark. With it, Jesus subverts and redeploys a structure of violent oppression, crucifixion, and turns it to a peaceful feast. He reverses the movement of the fall, which counted divinity a thing to be grasped. He re-befriends the body and creates the bread of heaven by counting divinity not a thing to be grasped. At the Last Supper, he performs a deathbed wedding as if he said, you can't violate my body here, I give it to you. He becomes a bridegroom of blood. You can't exsanguinate me. Drink this, 
all of you. Gethsemane's bitterest cup becomes the toast at a wedding feast. Marriage, therefore, interprets the atonement. In both cases, a body is given to another with all its precious fluids. In both cases, the gift begins in desire and ends in charity. Jesus did not die for his spouse because his desire was faint, but because his passion was great. Jesus takes on the body to befriend it, to rescue it from scorn. He gives it in commitment to another. The atonement, like marriage, does not bypass the body, but elevates it as gift. The remaining issue in the marriage debates is complementarity. Whether two men or two women may represent Christ and the church. Elsewhere, I argue they must. Otherwise, the incarnation leaves out women and the church leaves out men. Typology does not close off representation, but opens it up. Otherwise, typology becomes sub-Christian, inadequate to the incarnation confining an infinite God. Tonight, however, I leave that argument to close with same-sex examples from Thomas Aquinas and Simeon the New Theologian. Aquinas's anti-gay use of contrary to nature is well known, but he also seems to know something about the Greek, which is parafusin. Para is a spatial preposition, meaning alongside or beyond, as in parallel or paraclete, which is not the same as anti or contra. We preserve it in paralegal and paramedic, who work alongside and not against. Aquinas notices that Paul repeats the phrase paraphysin in Romans 11. There it describes God's love for Gentiles, the same ones whom Paul had characterized with same-sex desire in Romans 1. Aquinas sees that Paul's reuse of paraphysical language in Romans 11 must destabilize rigid accounts of God and nature. Aquinas explains that God's acting, quote, contra naturam in Romans 11 just is natural in the analogical sense of natural to God. Quote, that which God does is not against nature, non est contra naturam, but is simply natural, said simpliciter est naturale, since every creature is naturally subject to God, whatever God does in the creature is simply natural, even if it is not natural according to the proper and particular nature of the thing in which God does it. For example, when God enlightens the blind and raises the dead. As a piece of conceptual analysis, this clarification may look pedestrian. But as a piece of exegesis, it is remarkable. Aquinas' understanding of Paul prompts him to contradict the Latin Bible. The Vulgate says contra naturam. Aquinas says no. Aquinas replaces a negation, contra, with a positive emphatic, simpliciter. Aquinas is following the Greek, and not the Vulgate, with precision. For Aquinas, exceeding or moving beyond nature belongs to God's identity as a boundary-crossing spreader of goodness. God acts paraphysically in the incarnation itself. Paul's spirit of adoption also works paraphysically expanding nature, according to Greco-Roman adoption theory, 
where the father's pnevma, my sister is Greek, and so I use modern Greek pronunciation, where the father's pneuma, pnevma, is not just spirit, but, has anybody taught you this, seminal fluid, which causes both biological and adoptive children to resemble him. Interpreting Romans 8.17 on becoming children of God, Aquinas makes bold where moderns may blush. And I quote, the phrase becoming children of God is clear from a comparison to physical children who are begotten by physical semen proceeding from the father. For the spiritual semen proceeding from the father is the Holy Spirit. And therefore, by this semen, some human beings are generated as children of God. 1 John 3, 9, quote in the quote, everyone who is born of God does no sin since the semen of God remains in him. Semen de manit in eo. Now, if semen in Latin means both semen and seed, Aquinas places it without apology in a sexual context. He's not talking about plants. Again, Aquinas usually genders the human soul feminine to God's male and then removes God from a particular gender as beyond categories and source of all. But here, because he's quoting 1 John, Aquinas uses masculine pronouns without comment for both sides of a sexual encounter by which God regenerates, refathers, or perhaps breeds and seeds Gentiles. Surely Aquinas didn't have a sense of humor, did he? In any case, his account retains the spirit of Paul's desire to shock. And it puts a different spin on how to be born again in the Middle Ages. Of course, semen is another form of blood, the kind that makes children blood relatives to their father. For my final example, I quote Simeon, the new theologian. In his 10th ethical discourse, a rebel has fought against the emperor of the Christians for many years. Like the prodigal, however, the rebel returns. Quote, when he approached the emperor and embraced his feet, shades of Ruth, he wept and asked forgiveness. Seized by unexpected joy, the good emperor immediately accepted him. Raising him up, the emperor fell upon his neck and kissed him, internal quotation from prodigal son, kissed him all over, Simeon adds, and on his eyes, which had been weeping. Then he ordered a crown and robe and sandals, as he was wearing, and himself clothed his former rival. Shades of the prodigal and of Jonathan. And not only this, but night and day he was rejoicing in him, and being glad, this is the emperor rejoicing in the subordinate rebel, and being glad and embracing him and kissing his mouth with his own. So much did he love him exceedingly that he was not separated from him even in sleep, laying down with him and embracing him on his bed and covering him all over with his cloak as Boaz did for Ruth, and placing his face upon all his members." Unquote. I return to the subversive repetition that gospel writers place on the lips of Jesus. They portray the Last Supper as queering a structure of violent oppression to make communion a repeated feast. There Jesus does not avoid, 
but redirects the language of blood, saying over the wine, this is my blood. Do this to remember me. Our churches also cannot avoid, but must redirect the language of blood if they do that to remember him. Thank you.